How complicated are these little organisms? What what, what are we talking about? It depends on how you define complication. <laughs> okay, so I I could tell that you uh, appreciate and respect the full complexity of even the most seemingly uh, primitive organisms because none of them are primitive. Okay, that said, what what kind of what what are we talking about? How how um, what kind of machineries do they have? that you're working with when you're injecting them with DNA? So I will start with one of the most fascinating machineries that we target, which is the translation machinery. Mm -hmm. It is um, a a very unique uh, subsystem of cellular life uh, in comparison to, uh, I would say, metabolism. And uh, we used to, um, you know, when we are thinking about cellular life, we think of cell as the basic unit. Uh, or the building block. Uh, but from a key perspective, that's uh, not the case. That one may argue that everything that happens inside the cell serves the translation uh, and the translation machinery. Um, there is a nice paper that called this that the entire cell is hopelessly addicted to this main informatic computing, biological, chemical system that it is operating at the heart of the cell. Which is the translation. It is the translation. What's translation from what to what? So RNA to enzymes? It converts a linear sequence of mRNA into a folded, uh, later folded protein. Uh, that's that's when the, uh, that's the core processing center for information for life. It uh, has multiple steps. It initiates, it elongates, it, um, terminates and it recycles. It operates uh, discrete bits uh, of information. It's itself is like a chemical decoding device. And mm-hmm. that is incredibly unique for translation that I don't think you will find anywhere else in the cell that does this. So even though it's called translation, it's really like a factory that reads the schematic and builds a three-dimensional object. It's like a printer. I would divide it into actually even four more additional steps or disciplines than what would it take to study it by the way you described it. Mm -hmm. It's a chemical system. It's the compounds that make it up are Mm -hmm. chemicals. It's physical. It tracks the energy to make its job, to do its job. It's informatic. What is processed are the bits. It's computational. Uh, the discrete states that the system is placed uh, when the information is being processed, that's itself is computational. And it's biological. It's a, uh, there's variability and inheritance that come from imperfect replication even and infer- imperfect computation. So oh, you're- man, that's so good. So from the biology comes the, um, like when you mess up, the bugs are the features, that's the biology. Informatics is obvious in the RNA, that's a set of information there. Uh, the different steps along the way is actually kind of what the computer does with, with bits, it's their own computation. Physical, there's a, a I guess, the, 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 like a, almost like a mechanical process to the whole thing that requires energy and it actually, is, you know, it's manipulating actual physical objects. And uh, chemical is because you have to, ultimately it's all chemistry. Yeah. And it tracks this information. So it is almost a mini computer device inside our cells. Yeah. And that's the oldest uh, computational device of life. It's it's uh, likely the key uh, operation system that had to evolve for life to emerge. It's uh, more interesting or <laughs> it's more complicated in interesting ways than the computers we have today. I mean, everything you said, which is really, really nice. I mean, I guess our computers have the informatic and they have the computational, but they don't have the chemical, the physical, or the biology. Exactly, and and the computers don't have, don't link information to function, right? They, right. they are not tightly coupled, nowhere close to what translation, uh, and, or the way translation does it. So that's the number one, I think, difference between the two. And um, yes, it's it's informatic, and we can um, uh, discuss this further too. One hundred percent. 
let's please discuss <laughs> this further. Which part are we discussing further? Each one of those are fascinating worlds, each each of the five. Yeah, so, well, we can start with the more, I guess, the the ones that are more established, which is the, the chemical aspect of the translation machinery. It's uh, the, the specific uh, compounds make up the assembly of RNA. Chemists showed this in many different ways. We can rip apart the entire machinery. We know that at the core of it, there's an RNA that, um, uh, that operates not only as an information information system itself or information itself, but also as an enzyme. And and origin of life chemists make these molecules easily now. We know we can manipulate RNA, we can make even with single pot chemistries, we, we can create compounds. What's a single pot chemistry? Um, that's, uh, I would say, when you add all the recipes that you know that will lead you to the final product. This is what or original life container. chemists do, is they, they come up with this pot, they throw a bunch of chemicals in, and they try to, <laughs> try to. <laughs> they're basically chefs of, of a certain kind. I'm not sure if that's what they call it, but that's how I think of it, because it is all combined in a test tube, and you know the outcome, and uh, and it's, it's very mathematical once you know the right environment and the right chemistry that needs to get into this container or this pot, uh, you know what the outcome is. There is no luck there anymore. It's a pretty rigid, established uh, input-output system, and it's all chemistry. So you actually wear a lot of hats. Is one of them uh, origin of life chemist? My PhD is in chemistry, but I don't do uh, origin of life chemistry. But you're interested in origin of life. Yes, absolutely. So some I, of your some of your best friends are origin of life chemists. <laughs> just make sure that you have good chemist friends if you're interested in origin of life. Yeah, that's a hundred percent requirement. It should be mandatory. <laughs> okay, so chemistry. Uh, so, so what else about this machinery that we need to know chemically? Well, uh, chemically, I think th that's it. You have enzymes. You have proteins. The enzymes are doing their thing. They, they know how to chew energy using ATP or GTP. They 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 know what to do on their in their own way. They do their enzymatic thing. Uh, so it's not just the, the ribosome that is at the heart of the translation, but there are a lot of different proteins. You're looking about a hundred different components that compose this machinery. Uh, well, let me ask kind of, maybe it's a ridiculous question, but did the chemistry make this machine or did the machine use chemistry to achieve a purpose? So like, um, I guess there's a lot of different chemical possibilities on Earth. Is is this ma translation machinery just like uh, choosing, picking and choosing different chemical reactions that it can use to achieve a purpose? Uh, or did the chemistry basically, like uh, there's like a momentum, like a constraint to the thing that can only build a certain kind of machinery? There's basically, is, is, is chemistry fundamental? Or is is it just emergent? Like, how important is chemistry to this whole process? You cannot have uh, life without chemistry. You cannot have any cellular process without chemistry. What makes life interesting is that even if the chemistry is imperfect, even if there are accidents along the way, if something binds to uh, another chemical in in a way it shouldn't, um, there is resilience within the system that it can maybe not necessarily repair itself, but it moves on. However, imperfect uh, mistakes can be handled. That's where the biology comes That's in. where the biology comes in. But in terms of chemistry, you absolutely cannot have a translation machinery without chemistry. And so you, you're, as I said, there are four main steps. These are the core steps that are conserved in all translation machinery. And I should say, all life has this machine, mm -hmm. right? Every cell, on everything. Earth. On Earth. On Earth. Yeah. <laughs> yes. When you think of this machine, do you think very specifically about the kind of machinery that we're talking about, or do you think more philosophically, a machine that converts information into function? It's I, I cannot separate the two. I think what makes this machinery fascinating is that those five components that I listed are, they, they coexist. So for instance, if we, uh, let's just, talking about the chemistry part, um, we we know the certain um, rate constant uh, all these proteins that operate in this machinery needs to harbor in order to uh, get the mechanism going 
right? If you are bringing the the information to the translation machinery and you are the initiator of this uh, computation system, you need to have. Uh, you can only afford a certain range of mistakes. If you're too fast, then the next uh, message cannot be delivered fast. If you're too slow, then you may stall the process. So there is definitely a, a chemistry constant going on within the machinery. Um, again, it's it's not perfect, far from it, uh, but uh, they all uh, have their own uh, margin of error that they can tolerate versus they cannot, otherwise they collapse, the system collapses. <laughs> so it's like a jazz ensemble, the notes of the chemistry, but you can be I a little I love that you said jazz, it's definitely true. It's a party and it's like everybody's invited and, and, <laughs> and they need to operate together Right and and they um, and what's really cool about it I think or there are many things that are very interesting about this thing but if you take if you remove it from the cell and put it in a cell free environment it d works just fine right so you can get cell free translation systems uh, put this translation in a, a test tube and it is doing its thing it it doesn't need the rest of the cell to translate information of course you need to feed the information at least so far, um, it, but because we are far from evolving a translation, maybe not so far, uh, evolving a translation in the lab uh, or a, a, a machinery that can process information as it generates it. We have not done that yet. It's a pretty complicated machinery, so it's hard for to, for those uh, origin of life chemists to find a pot that generates. Because it's far more than chemistry. You need you need uh, biology, obviously. You need biochemistry, you need to think as a, I think, a network systems folk, you need to think about computation, you need to think about information. And and that is not uh, happening yet, except we are trying to bring this perspective. Uh, but the more you understand uh, how information systems work, you cannot, once you see it, you cannot unsee it. It's one of those things. So, but you can still rip it out and the chemistry happens. Yes. And chemistry can happen even with uh, even if you strip some of the parts out. It can uh, you can get very minimal uh, level of information processing that does not look anything like the translation that cells relies on, but that but chemists showed from linear. Uh, you can generate information that arrives to a processing center in the form of a linear uh, polymer. But the informatic part of this system that I think sets it apart from computation and from metabolism comes in if you think about the information itself, right? So we have four nucleotide letters that compose DNA, and um, they are processed in the translation in triplets. So you have in, in triplet uh, codon fragments. So you have four times four times four. So you have 64 possible states that can be encoded by four letters in three positions. Mm -hmm. All right, so... It's so amazing. Yeah. It's so amazing. There is only one code yeah. that says start. That's the, that there's only one. And then there's two, if not three, that says stop. So that's, that's, that's what you work with. But you can have 64 possible states, but life only uses 20 amino acids. So we use six life uses 64 possible states minus four of the starts and stops to code for 20 amino acids in different combinations. That is really amazing. If you think about there, there are 500 different amino acids life can choose, right? It narrowed it down to 20. We don't know why a lot of people think about this genetic code is quite fascinating. So far, in its own right? Line. I mean, it didn't do it for 4 billion years. I don't know. We may wait for another 4 billion years. But, but you didn't have those amino acids in the very beginning, right? Like uh, We don't know. So it, we, we would be fooling ourselves if we said we know exactly how, how many amino acids existed so, early on. But there's no reason to think that it, it uh, wasn't the same or set. Or similar. Yeah. It, we, yeah. Don't, we don't have a good reason. But, but because roughly 20 out of 60 states are used, you're using one-third of your possible states in the in your information system. So it, it, this may seem like a waste, but informatically it's important because it's abundant and it is um, redundant, right? Mm, yeah. So so it, the, this code degeneracy, you see this in 
that's implemented by this translation machinery inside the cell. So it, it means you can make errors, right? You yeah. can make errors, but the message will still get through. You you can speak m- missing some letters to the information can miss some parts, but the message will still get through. So that's two thirds of the not used states give, gives you that robustness and resilience within the system. So at the, at the informatic level, there's room for error. There's probably room for error probably in all five uh, categories we're talking about. There's probably room for error in the computation. There's probably room for error. Yeah, in the physical. there's yes, exactly. Everywhere there's room. Yeah, for error. because because the this informatic capacity is made possible together with the other um, components, and not only that, but also the the product yields a function no, uh, in this case, enzyme or protein, mm-hmm. right? So so. That's really amazing to me. <laughs> <laughs> it is. I mean, I mean, in my head, just so you know, because I'm a, a, a computer science AI person, the the parallels between even like language models that encode language, or now they're able to encode basically any kind of thing, including um, images and actions, all of in this kind of way. The the, the parallel in, in in terms of informatic and uh, computation is just incredible. Yeah. 